fear and thankfulness today. Welcome. It's another look into the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot, who called us to live to a higher standard every day. To not be satisfied with just a little religion as a shallow substitute for what God wants for us. The series will continue in the coming weeks as we hear from family, friends, and others, all influenced by Elizabeth's life and message. Today we continue our short series on the Psalms as we hear five principles to relieve fear and being thankful for troubles. Does that seem possible? Fear and thankfulness are topic today. We'll be hearing from a friend of Elizabeth, Eileen Chambers, who talks about suffering, as uh, that can be a fearful thing. Ecuadorian missionary Frank Collinger joins us again. When he hears the name Elizabeth, what's the first thing that comes to his mind? Think about that with Frank later today. First, though, it's the Psalms, part three, five principles to relieve fear. You might want to write these down. You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliot, talking again today about the Psalms. We're thinking about the Psalms as the most human heart cries of any of the books in the Bible. And the Psalms instruct us as to how to respond how to keep the commandments, how to do what God wants us to do in our ordinary, everyday situations. Psalm 37 is a good example of a very human cry. We get upset at the evil that we see around us. And if you watch television or read a newspaper, every single day brings appalling news. And sometimes we wonder, why do we listen? Why do we need to know all that? There was a much simpler time when people couldn't know all that, and it seemed as though they were much happier in those days. But let's remember, we're going back thousands of years when we're talking about the writers of the Psalms. And Psalm 37 begins right out with, Fret not thyself because of evildoers. Now, if somebody said to you, fret not thyself because of evildoers, you'd look at them kind of funny. We don't talk that way, do we? But we do talk this way. Do not fret because of evil men. Or you could say, do not get excited or do not get upset. Don't be annoyed by anyone who does wrong and don't envy them. They will soon disappear like grass without rain. Well, if we're supposed to not fret and not be upset, what are we supposed to do? Well, verse 3 tells us, trust in the Lord. That's the antidote. That's the best medicine for fretting and stewing. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, that particular verse has meant a great deal to me in my life because in my early days when I was a young college student about to graduate, I had entered into what we used to call senior panic because if a girl didn't meet a Christian husband on a Christian campus where there were hundreds of unattached, attractive males, Then she began to enter into panic, thinking, maybe I never will get a husband. And that was exactly the way I was feeling as a senior in college. And the Lord was reminding me that I had to trust him, that I did not know what the future held, but I knew the one who held the future. So I am to leave my desires and believe that God is going to fulfill them in his time and in his way. And verse 4 of Psalm 37 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, of course, I wanted to take that as a promise that God was going to give me a husband and children. But the man that I was hoping would someday be my husband pointed out another possible interpretation of that verse. 
He said to me, if you delight yourself in the Lord, then he is going to give you the right desires. The desires that he will give you will be righteous ones. And they will then, by that time, be the desires of your heart. So I began to realize that probably my own desires needed correction from time to time. Let the Lord lead you and trust him to help. Then it will be as clear as the noonday sun that you were right. Have you been misrepresented or lied about or gossiped about? What are you supposed to do about that? How do you handle it? Verse 5, Psalm 37, commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when men succeed. So I have put a line, not just underline, but I've actually put a little rectangle around five principles in Psalm 37. Do not fret. Trust in the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord. Commit your way to the Lord, which means hand it over. And again, do not fret. I should have put one around, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. And that's probably one of the very hardest things for us to do, isn't it? Just to be still and to wait patiently. And again and again in the Psalms, we find the psalmist crying out to God, how long, O Lord? How long does this have to go on? How long am I supposed to wait for you? But the psalmist waits. And that's a spiritual discipline, isn't it? There are 150 psalms, you know, so we can't begin to scratch the surface, but these are just a few that I've picked out, most of them from psalms which may not be quite so familiar to you as some others. But Psalm 42 is familiar to many. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. A good antidote when you're feeling depressed, miserable, weepy, thirsty, abandoned, disturbed. That's exactly what is described in this psalm. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night. While men say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. And after all that, verse 5, why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. And here's an interesting verse that follows that. My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you. A man feeling depressed, miserable, weepy, thirsty, abandoned, and disturbed says, therefore, I will remember you. That's an act of the will versus all those debilitating emotions that put you in the sinkhole. Note how he wobbles back and forth. After saying that, Then in verses 8 and 9, By day the Lord directs his love. At night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. He sounds very reassured there, doesn't he? And in the very next verse he says, I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by my enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, Where is your God? Why are you downcast, O my soul? This is a dialogue, isn't it, in the soul? I find myself arguing with myself quite often. So he goes from, Therefore I will remember you, to why have you forgotten me, and my bones suffer mortal agony. And then he's 
sort of taking himself by the scruff of the neck and saying, why are you downcast, O my soul? Why are you so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. That word put is a very strong, blunt verb, isn't it? It's an imperative. You've got to put your trust, your hope in God. Why do you think God preserved these heart cries of a suffering man for you and me? Surely it was for our instruction and comfort so that you and I would know that it's all right to cry to God. If we're going to cry, there's no better place to go to cry than to him who has promised to put my tears in his bottle we can emphasize to him all the trials and tribulations we've been going through, but not to everybody else. You remember that old song, nobody knows the trouble I've seen, nobody knows but Jesus. We all know some people who, about whose troubles we know a whole lot more than we want to. A friend of mine said of a friend of hers, there are so few things about her that only God knows. Obviously a person who does a lot of talking about herself. It's wonderful if nobody knows the trouble I've seen, nobody knows but Jesus. He's always there. He's always ready to listen. And he's always so glad when we are willing to put our trust in him. So bring your complaints to the throne of God. They're not new to him. He's heard them before. He has preserved them for us in the book of Psalms. And he wants his children to come to him in trouble as well as with their praises. May God give us the confidence, the trust, the absolute assurance that he's there every minute of every hour of every day of every week, of every month, of every year. I will never leave you or forsake you, he says. And you might as well tell God exactly how you're feeling, because he already knows, and he wants to hear it directly from you. Number three in a five-part look at the Psalms, five principles to relieve fear. Did you get all five? Well, we're going to hear from Frank Kohlinger later. He's an Ecuadorian missionary. He spent decades serving there and still travels back to minister. But first, Eileen Chambers joins us, longtime friend of Elizabeth and the screenwriter for a book by Valerie called Devotedly. We've been thinking about fear today. Do you fear the idea of suffering? You see, when it came to the Christian faith and following Jesus, Elizabeth Elliot pulled no punches. And as hard as it is for us to imagine today, she was a Christian who was not afraid to be unpopular or to address the tough questions and issues. As I've said before, to me, she was a real deal. And if you look at her life, it's highs and lows. I know you will find in her a Christian who walked the talk. Jesus was her closest companion. His word, the Bible, the place where she encountered him, the living God every day. And in a world no less unstable and topsy-turvy than ours, Elizabeth trusted and believed him even to the end. And the good news is that because of the Elizabeth Elliot Foundation, her teachings, life story, and presence lives on. My hope for you is that you partake deeply and discover not only Elizabeth Elliot, but the Jesus Christ whom she loved. A friend of Elizabeth and writer Eileen Chambers. Later on, we hear from longtime Ecuadorian missionary Frank Kohlinger. And uh, what's the first thing that comes to mind when he hears the name Elizabeth Elliot? That's later. First, though, it's part four in our five-part look at the Psalms, being thankful for troubles. <laughs> is that possible? You know, there are 66 books in the Bible, and one of the books is called the Psalms, P-S-A-L-M-S. -S. And the Psalms are the most human, we might say, of all the books of the Bible. The shouts of praise, 
the anger at enemies, the despair of a soul feeling utterly forsaken, the joy of one whose feet have been set on a rock, praises and complaints, trust and distrust, tears of sorrow, tears of joy, emotions. We are emotional people, aren't we? Some more so than others, but all of us have emotions, and we feel things. And it's a very real part of being human to speak as the psalmist speaks. One of the reasons that God must have preserved this book for us is so that we might know that he is a God who made human beings, and he therefore understands human beings as no human being can understand himself. And God is not surprised or taken aback or irritated or angered when we say whatever is in our minds. To me, it's a wonderful thing to realize that I can't say anything to God that he doesn't already know before I say it, because he knows my thoughts before I think them. And I learned that from the Psalms, too. Well, let me read to you from Psalm 50. From east to west, the powerful Lord God has been calling together everyone on earth. God shines brightly from Zion, the most beautiful city. Our God approaches, but not silently. A flaming fire comes first, and a storm surrounds him. God comes to judge his people. He shouts to the heavens and to the earth, Call my followers together. They offered me a sacrifice, and we made an agreement. You see there the relationship between God and his people. They offered me a sacrifice, and we made an agreement. The God of heaven deigns to deal with you and me. Well, that's my parenthesis there. I'm going on with verse 6 in Psalm 50. The heavens announce God is the judge, and he is always honest. My people, I am God. Israel, I am your God. Listen to my charges against you. Although you offer sacrifices and always bring gifts, I won't accept your offerings of bulls and goats. Every animal in the forest belongs to me, and so do the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds in the mountains, and every wild creature is in my care. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you, because I own the world and everything in it. I don't eat the meat of bulls or drink the blood of goats. I am God Most High. The only sacrifice I want is for you to be thankful and to keep your word. Let's pause on that verse. The only sacrifice I want is for you to be thankful and to keep your word. Can you be thankful in the midst of trouble and suffering? I was speaking with a man just the other night on the telephone whose wife has been in the hospital for most of the last year and a half or so, a woman who has suffered tremendously with a very uh, vicious and fast-moving kind of cancer, and she has two little sons, and she wants to see them grow up. And it's wonderful to see the testimony of these two people accepting day by day what's happening. And I have seen in them this sacrifice of praise. The only sacrifice I want is for you to be thankful and to keep your word, the Lord says. And there are times when we really can't do anything else, aren't there? Times when we feel utterly useless and helpless. And it is at, that, at those times that we can still lift up our hearts and say, thank you, Lord. You're still there. I'm here. You have put me here for a purpose. Help me now to be faithful to you and to keep my word. The Psalms instruct us in how to pray. Verse 15, God is saying, pray to me in time of trouble. I will rescue you, and you will honor me. 
But to the wicked, I say, you don't have the right to mention my laws or claim to keep our agreement. You refused correction and rejected my commands. You made friends with every crook you met, and you liked people who break their wedding vows. You talked only about violence and told nothing but lies. You sat around gossiping, ruining the reputation of your own relatives. When you did all of this, I didn't say a word, and you thought, God is just like us. But now I will accuse you. You have ignored me, so pay close attention, or I will tear you apart, and no one can help you. The sacrifice that honors me is a thankful heart. Obey me, and I, your God, will show my power to save. One question that comes often in radio mail is, how am I supposed to accept this terrible thing that has happened? We have instruction in verse 23 of Psalm 50. The sacrifice that honors me is a thankful heart. Can you not think of one pleasant thing for which you can thank God? Do you thank him only for the pleasant things? Have you walked with him long enough to be able to thank him for hard things? Will we ever walk with him long enough to thank him for everything? That's what I want to learn before I die, and I don't have that many decades left, I don't suppose. The Psalms are instruction in how to respond and how to pray. We're very aware of our sinfulness, and the more we read the Bible, the more hopeless we might become if we were not told how to go about repenting. And Psalm 51 is a psalm on repentance. Here are the words that you can use. Just use these same words. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Now this is a psalm written by David, and we do know some of the sins of David. Perhaps the one that most people would know would be his adultery with Bathsheba, and then the sin of trying to get her husband murdered, which he eventually succeeded in doing. And this is who's writing this psalm. I acknowledge my transgressions. My sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. We see here the psalmist's abject repentance and then his expectation that the Lord can make him joyful again. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Any of you remember what Corey Ten Boom used to say about sins? The Bible tells us that God casts them into the depths of the sea, and Corey Ten Boom added, and he puts up a sign, no fishing. Create in me a clean heart, O God and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Well, that's not quite all of the psalm, but 
It does give us instruction as to what to say when we feel as though we have no words. And the psalmist is a sinner, as is every writer in the Bible. The people that God used were all sinners. And the most prominent figures in the Bible were among the greatest of sinners. I think of Moses and David and the Apostle Paul. We're told about their sins in order that we might know that none of us is disqualified from being a child of God and a servant of God if we're willing to repent. Psalm 66 says, Our God, you tested us just as silver is tested. You trapped us in a net and gave us heavy burdens. You sent war chariots to crush our skulls. We traveled through fire and through floods, but you brought us to a land of plenty. I will bring sacrifices into your house, my God, and I will do what I promised when I was in trouble. Well, there's a thing. How many of us have made a wild promise to God? If you'll only get me out of this, I'll praise you or I'll serve you for the rest of my life. Have we kept our word? Being Thankful for Troubles, Part 4 in the Look at the Psalms. Well, we uh, mentioned that Ecuadorian missionary Frank Kohlinger is joining us again today. And what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the name Elizabeth Elliot? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is her, her dedication, uh, spirituality, her linguistic expertise. Uh, she's a in my opinion, an excellent was an excellent linguist. Of course, her desire to to live for the Lord back in those days, and uh, I guess until she she went to be with the Lord. Longtime Ecuadorian missionary Frank Kohlinger. Thank you, sir. Well, as I mentioned, this is a short series, and we just have one more in this series on the Psalms. So join us for that next time. But we're just about out of time, so let me thank you again for letting us come into your home. Maybe to join you at the office or along with you as you jogged, wherever we found you. Thanks for being a part of our our time together today. On behalf of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, in cooperation with the Bible Broadcasting Network, let me invite you to join us at elizabethelliot.org for more Gateway to Joy programs, videos, and more. ElizabethElliot.org. Jen via Apple Podcasts says, This podcast and Elizabeth Elliot have helped me refocus on the hope of the gospel and my calling as a wife and mom. Thank you so much for making her recordings available here. I'm eternally grateful. Well, thank you, Jen. Hey, until next time, may God remind you daily that you're loved with an everlasting love. And underneath are those everlasting arms.